Today I did my Saturday run at the Rocky Flats Wildlife Refuge in Jefferson County, Colorado. The site is home to over 10 miles of hiking trails, numerous species of wildlife, and gorgeous views of the mountains. While this site is beautiful today, the site was once an extremely controversial nuclear weapons plant. The story of the Rocky Flats plant is filled with moments of secrecy, corruption, and conspiracy. And like the small amounts of radioactive plutonium that still linger in this space, controversy over the safety of the site has not yet subsided, or shall I say, decayed. In this video, I will explore the history of America's once largest plutonium pit plant. World War II ended with an Allied victory shortly after the United States successfully detonated the most powerful weapon the world had ever seen, the atomic bomb, twice. After the Allied victory, tensions rose between the U.S. and the Soviet Union, two countries possessing nuclear weapons capabilities. These tensions led into the Cold War, an era where both countries competed against each other for global influence. This competition occurred through aggressive propaganda campaigns, espionage, technology competitions, and most importantly, a nuclear arms race. During the Cold War, America was focused on dramatically increasing its stockpile of nuclear weapons fueled by an ideology of mutually assured destruction, chasing the idea that if one country were to destroy the opposing country with nuclear weapons, the attacking country would also be destroyed. This is where we begin the story of the Rocky Flats plant. The Atomic Energy Commission was a federal government agency created in 1946 through the Atomic Energy Act signed into law by Truman. The goal of the AEC was to manage the development, use, and control of atomic or nuclear energy for military and civilian applications. The AEC was a civilian-controlled commission with a CEO appointed by the president that managed the hiring of scientists and professionals for developing nuclear technologies such as reactors and weapons. The Atomic Energy Act gave the Commission extraordinary powers when conducting its responsibilities. This was due to the need for secrecy with many of its operations to prevent information from getting into the hands of the Soviet Union. The primary mission of the AEC was expanding the United States nuclear arsenal, and it was for that reason that the Commission selected numerous sites for weapons development. In 1951, the Atomic Energy Commission announced that a four-square-mile section located within the Boulder and Jefferson County areas would be used to build a new atomic plant. The Commission did not state what they would be producing for security reasons. Part of the provisions of the Atomic Energy Act that created the AEC gave the agency the ability to keep information about its nuclear technologies and operations secret and away from the public. This secrecy would become one of the central themes of the story of the Rocky Flats. The AEC selected the Dow Chemical Company to manage the site. In 1953, the plant officially began producing plutonium pits to be used in atomic bombs. Plutonium pits are what cause the main fuel source in a nuclear weapon to explode. In a nutshell, when a bomb is detonated, the plutonium pit creates an initial nuclear explosion that compresses the uranium, which is the main fuel source, within the bomb to create an even larger explosion. During its operation, the Rocky Flats plant was America's largest producer of plutonium pits and is estimated to have produced 1,000 to 2,000 pits a year according to the U.S. Department of Energy. These pits would be shipped to other locations to be assembled into nuclear weapons. Plutonium is not something you would want to hold in your hands. It is highly radioactive and takes 250,000 years to degrade entirely and has the potential to cause massive environmental devastation, as well as numerous health effects, including numerous types of cancer. However, for a time, the extent of these health hazards was not well known. Despite the AEC preventing the public from knowing that weapons components were produced at the plant, many viewed the development of the Rocky Flats plant as a positive thing for the surrounding Rocky Mountain areas. Not only was the public supportive of the nation's defense strategy, but the plant also brought in numerous jobs and economic activity to the surrounding area, and like a bomb, it caused a housing boom. The positive view of the plant did not last forever, though. As time went on, the plant would make some Homer Simpson-level mistakes in handling its contamination, with devastating consequences for the surrounding area.
The Rocky Flats plant had many accidents during its operation that caused radioactive material to be released into the surrounding environment. As a result of the sensitive nature of the work at Rocky Flats, many of these accidents did not get significant press coverage. In 1957, a fire erupted in one of the glove boxes in Building 771, causing some plutonium to escape into the atmosphere when one of the filters was damaged. The AEC responded to the incident, saying that plutonium contamination caused by the fire was insignificant. However, it was not known how much radioactive contamination was released into the Denver metro area from this incident. The 1957 fire was just the beginning of the environmental mishaps committed by the Rocky Flats plant. In the 1960s, it was found that barrels of oil contaminated with plutonium waste that were stored outside at the plant had been leaking into the soil for multiple years, resulting in contamination of the soil and water. Some of this waste in the soil also became airborne from heavy winds. The extent of contamination to the surrounding environment through these two accidents would not be known for a period of time. The Rocky Flats plant seemed to have evaded scrutiny from most of the public throughout the 50s and 60s. This was due to a variety of factors, such as the lack of governmental oversight on the Atomic Energy Commission's operations and the positive impact the plant had economically on the area as well. The AEC had so much autonomy that they were allowed to independently self-report or not report the contamination events that occurred to the government and local stakeholders. Any statement made by the AEC to the government was not questioned. That all started to change when a larger fire erupted in 1969 inside of yet another glove box. While the 1969 fire was estimated to have leaked less plutonium to the surrounding environment, subsequent independent testing conducted on the surrounding area showed evidence of contamination. This resulted in the release of information to the public about contamination to populated areas occurring from activities at the plant. Officials stated that the detected contamination was actually primarily the result of the 1957 fire and leakage of radioactive waste from the storage containers, rather than the 1969 fire. Some experts have stated that had the roof of the plant been breached by the 1969 fire, Colorado would have faced a disaster on the scale of the Chernobyl catastrophe. The 1969 fire marked a shift in public perception of the plant, and the public began to doubt the claims of safety made by the Atomic Energy Commission. During the mid-1970s, the American public became more concerned with environmental issues and the impacts the plant was having on the surrounding communities. In 1977, the newly formed Department of Energy took over the responsibilities of the Atomic Energy Commission. During the mid-1970s to late 80s, numerous protests occurred at the Rocky Flats plant demanding it to be shut down, occasionally with some protesters even being arrested. One significant protest occurred on October 15, 1983, where tens of thousands of protesters held hands encircling the 17-mile perimeter of the plant, demanding that it be shut down. In the late 1980s, plant whistleblowers began informing the FBI about environmental crimes the plant was committing internally. The whistleblowers detailed their concerns that the plant was unsafe. They claimed that the way the plant was processing waste was illegal and that the plant was not at all in compliance with environmental regulations. Additionally, the FBI found evidence that Building 771, a building in the plant that had previously been closed due to safety violations, was still secretly operating an incinerator to incinerate waste. This was enough evidence for the FBI to establish probable cause. On June 6, 1989, FBI and EPA agents entered the Rocky Flats plant under the pretense that they needed to discuss recent threats from an environmental group. Upon entering the plant, the FBI began to seize numerous documents. Over the course of the next 18 days, the FBI seized around a million documents from the plant. Among the documents seized was the diary of Dominic Sancini, one of the managers at the plant. The diary detailed events at the plant and had multiple memos mentioning his concern with the environmental violations occurring at the plant. Entries in the diary revealed how Sancini believed that the Department of Energy was not following the law and that the EPA could destroy him and the plant for the environmental crimes they were committing. The collected evidence led to a grand jury trial. The 23-member grand jury determined that eight individuals from both the Department of Energy and Rockwell International, one of the companies contracted to work at the plant, should be charged with environmental crimes. Instead, in a shocking turn of events, 
the judge fined Rockwell International $18.5 million and prevented any individuals from being charged with crimes. The members of the jury, who have since became known as the Rocky Flats 23, were bound to an oath of secrecy of their deliberations during the trial. Despite this, they asked the judge if they could publish their grand jury report to the public. Instead, the judge refused and sealed the grand jury report. Nevertheless, a few days later, the report was leaked to Westworld. In the report, the jurors accused both the Department of Energy and Rockwell officials as engaging in a continuing campaign of distraction, deception, and dishonesty. Even though the public was aware of the report through the Westworld leak, under law, the report remains sealed to this day. After the trial, Rockwell International was replaced by EG&G as the contracted company to work with the Department of Energy at the plant. EG&G promptly began drafting plans to remove contamination and aggressively revamp safety practices. However, shortly after their takeover of the plant, the Soviet Union dissolved in 1991. In 1992, the plant was no longer needed, and the long and expensive process of the site cleanup commenced. What do they do with these things after we seal them? I hear they dump them in an abandoned chalk mine and cover them with cement. I hear they're sending them to one of those southern states where the governor's a crook. Either way, I'm sleeping good tonight. For the low, low price of just $7 billion, four to six feet of soil was removed from all over the plant to remove massive amounts of contamination. This contamination was then shipped to New Mexico to be buried far away from populated areas. Most of the plant structures were also removed, except for a few structures located in the Central Operable Unit 1 location that could cause additional harm if they are removed. The cleanup was announced as complete in 2005, and much of the land was transferred to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, where it is known today as the Rocky Flats National Wildlife Refuge. Other than the Department of Energy-controlled Central Operable Unit 1 located in the center of the refuge, which is still too contaminated for unrestricted use, the rest of the surrounding land is now open to the public for a variety of recreational activities and nature watching. However, this wasn't without controversy. When the refuge was to be open for public use in 2018, several local groups filed a lawsuit to attempt to prevent the area from opening, citing the concern that human activity will stir up plutonium particles in the soil that could cause cancer if inhaled. On the day of the opening, 20 protesters stood in front of the EPA headquarters in Denver, insisting that the area around the plant remain closed to the public. Additionally, many local school districts have banned field trips to the Rocky Flats area due to radiation concerns. Locals have asked the EPA to conduct additional testing despite their insistence that the current radiation levels at the Rocky Flats are so low that you could spend over 100 days there a year and still receive a significantly less radiation dose than that of a medical x-ray. The Rocky Flats site story demonstrates the problems that can occur when an organization has blind trust and lacks proper government oversight and transparency. The Atomic Energy Commission and its successor, the Department of Energy and Rockwell International, were not held to high standards of safety when they were dealing with chemicals that caused billions of dollars in damage and threatened numerous lives. Despite the negligence toward safety from the Rocky Flats plant's operators, they seem to have gotten extremely lucky with the damage from their environmental mistakes and mishaps. These incidents could have been much more disastrous, possibly impacting the entire Denver metro area. The same can't be said for all of the workers. Some former employees of the plant eventually got a cancer diagnosis decades after working at the plant, which may have been attributed to the unsafe conditions they labored in. Some of these workers are still fighting hard to get remediation for their medical hardships. While I personally am excited to use the Rocky Flats Wildlife Refuge for my runs, I cannot help but think about the extremely low levels of radiation from the plutonium leaked at the plant decades ago that will still affect this environment in some way for thousands and thousands of years.